you have your Bibles, will you turn to a, a couple places, John 14, John 14, and then uh, go to the book of Colossians after that, chapter 1. So John 14, and then the book of Colossians, we're going to talk about a couple things here before we leave for the day. Whoa, I trip over my own feet. I just want to let you guys know that a lot of times God does things, you know, behind the scenes for us, and uh, we have some things kind of brewing, um, and in the right timing, again, we'll deliver those, but uh, we, I want you guys to begin to help me pray for one of my friends. He's a dear friend of mine. His name is Stanley Bentu, Stanley Bentu, and uh, he's a dear friend of ours. We met him at Christ for the Nations when we went to Bible school. So Stanley, if you're watching, because I know you do, I just wanted you to hear this publicly. So their time is a little off. So it's uh, Sunday evening for us, but it's tomorrow morning for him. He's already lived his Sunday. Isn't that kind of weird? <clears throat> when I traveled back to India, I was living like about 12 hours ahead of my family, 10 to 12 hours ahead of my family. So I, I had already lived the day before. So they were going to sleep and I was already waking up. I, th I just thought that was the craziest thing, right? But um, I, we're, we're working on some things um, just to, to really... Be a church that's mindful of missions. Uh, we do support missions uh, with the PCG. But I believe God has built something inside of my wife and I. And uh, I don't want to go too much into detail with that yet. But I just feel like I just want to throw it out there for you to begin to pray. Pray for India. Pray for India. India, there's, if you, if you look at statistics this way, one in 16 people are Indian in the world. So in Selma, that ratio is a little skewed because we have a large um, Punjabi population. We have a large Indian population from Northern India. And so they've concentrated in, in this area in the San Joaquin Valley. So many of you are familiar with, uh, with, with Indians, um, not, not American Indians, I'm talking from India. <clears throat> and it is probably one of the, the uh, biggest needs right now for us to evangelize as a church, as, a, as the American church. And um, I think I had no idea, I'll just say this way, I had no idea that I would be involved with helping uh, plant churches in India and, uh, and doing some things. My wife and I have helped do some things uh, over the last decade um, with our friend Stanley. And I just really sense his heart. His father died about a year, not quite a year ago, but his father passed away and he reached out and he was asking just for prayer, asking for support by way of being a brother. He's, I just call him my brother. Stanley, you're my brother. Uh, Salome, you're my sister, and their kids call me uncle, uncle, so I'm uncle, so, but uh, we, uh, we love you, and we were praying for you, I'm asking the church to pray for you, we're going to really believe God to take the vision that he's put in your heart and inside of you, that it didn't die with your father, that what God has done and he, what he's begun, he will see it to completion. And the, the desires that you have in your heart, my friend, God is going to, to move, to move you into purpose. And it's not just going to be a, a thrown together plan. It's going to be a well orchestrated, ordained plan from God. And I wanted to speak that to my friend Stanley. So pray for Stanley Bantu. He's asking us to pray for him in the ministry that God is birthing in him or continuing to do through him. Amen. Amen. One of these days you're going to have to meet him. So I'll, I'll have to have him come down. All right, so you're in John chapter 14. The season is upon us. Easter. Now, if I have any passion for life, it's to promote this message during this season, Resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. And I, I shared on Wednesday a little bit, and some of you guys were, were telling me, man, that was, was pretty awesome. But I started thinking about that and thinking, it's who we are. It should be who we are. We should be excited about the resurrected Savior, the resurrected Jesus every day. I preach the message here, even everyday resurrection. We are part of something phenomenal. Never in the history of the world, never in the history of the world, like, see, I can't get it out. <laughs> Never in the history of the world did a religious teacher rise from the dead. Muhammad didn't do it. Buddha didn't do it. 
Krishna. I don't know who their founder, the Hare Krishna. I don't even know. I think the Dalai Lama is still alive. But, you know, just all of that, all of these religious people, none of them can claim resurrection. It's what separates us from the rest of the known religions of the world. You know, God's people, favored people, we know the story, Father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Go through the history, we get Jesus from the Jewish people. When, when we pray for Jerusalem, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we also pray that they would have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he is Yeshua HaMashiach. I can't say the word. I'm going to get better at that. It's one of my goals. He is Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah. Not only to the Jewish people, but to the Gentile world. Jesus is Messiah. He's Savior. And so during this time, you're going to see a lot of things about Easter bunnies. You see a lot, of, <coughs> a lot of things about Easter. The eggs, the Cadbury eggs. I always make a joke about that every, every year. <coughs> Cadbury bunny. Okay, you, you got it. Is that good? Sound effects. <laughs> but think about it with me. I I just always see that. The enemy always tries to hijack the meaning and the depth of what we're celebrating. What we celebrate is the greatest story ever told about a man named Jesus coming, living. Come on. He was sinless. He died. He paid the penalty for our sin. And he gave us the greatest gift that we could ever have. That's eternal life through him. And I, as I communicate this morning, I felt like we needed to start somewhere to make sense of what I believe God is going to do when making us turn here and moving us forward into, into greater purpose. And I felt like, let's just start from the beginning all over again. And let's talk about the story of Jesus. Let's talk about the story of Jesus over the next few weeks as we begin to move toward that day, move toward Resurrection Sunday. Let's discover who Jesus is. So this morning, I want to make an attempt, and listen, I, I say that deliberately and intentionally, because I want to make an attempt to try to describe who Jesus is to you. And in my choice of words and the study that I've done and just looking at all the things that the Lord has given me to share this morning, I still feel inadequate in order to stand to say that this is who Jesus is. And, and I, I, I want to say this with, with uh, gosh, with, with conviction in my own heart, because I'm still discovering more about who he is every day. And I don't think that should ever stop in us. I think that there should be a hunger to try to discover who Jesus is on a daily basis. Listen, if you figured it out, come and tell me. I'm not kidding. You come and tell me. If you have a divine revelation, a truth that God is good, let's share it. I want to know. I want to. Pastor, did you know this about Jesus? Let's test it out. Like, let's, let's try it. Let's prove it with the word of God. Let's see who you have discovered he is to you. Because when you do, I'm praying, it comes out of you and you begin to share with others who he is. In John 14, we're going to drop down to verse 6. This morning, I've entitled this series, The Story of Jesus. That's simple. The Story of Jesus. And the title of this sermon is, I don't know if we get it up there. <coughs> you got to look to the very top. Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. And in John 14, this is what Jesus says about himself. John 14, verse 6, he says this. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Will you stand to your feet this morning? I feel like we just need to say this together. I, I feel like I just get inspired from, from time to time. I don't even know what I'm going to do half the time, I'm being honest. I just try, I write notes and then I just, I'm inspired. Whatever happens, happens and just pray that it's inspired by the Lord. Whatever your Bible says, will you read it with me? John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth 
and the life. One more time. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. One more time. Say it again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Once more, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Turn to your neighbor. We're going to do it two more times. I'll set that expectation. Will you turn to two or three if you can? Will you tell them, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right, now turn to the other neighbor on the other side. Come on, turn, turn to them. You need to hear from more than one person. Now tell them, tell them, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right, now you may be seated. Now who said that? Who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus said that. And it goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now go forward to Colossians. We're going to camp out in Colossians just for a minute. Paul the Apostle was the author of this epistle. And how many of you know that Paul was no ordinary man either? Paul was an enemy of the cross. Paul was a murderer. Paul thought he had it all right. Paul was, was going around persecuting Christians, and he martyred Stephen. We can find that in the book of Acts. And through the, I believe that through the testimony of Stephen, I believe this, and this is Pastor Louis' slant, that when, when, when Stephen was, was being stoned, I believe his words pierced Paul's heart and echoed all the way to the encounter that Jesus had with him on that Damascus road. I believe they were just kind of echoing inside of him, just over and over and over again. And, and I believe that there was a time and a season when God just said, all right, enough's enough. This is, this is the time I need to intervene in Paul's life now. Right here, right now. You know, my takeaways from when I study, my takeaways that when I read the Bible, I put myself in these guys' shoes. Read yourself into God's story. Read yourself in there. And when you do, it comes alive. The Bible comes alive. How many of us can honestly say that we haven't really fought for what God's heart is? We fought for what we thought was right. We thought this was the right way, but God said, no, that's you. That's religion. That's selfishness. That's pride. That's arrogance. But when you get into the book and when you get your face into this, this life-giving book, it begins to do something on the inside of you. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But as I, as I started reading myself in the story, I'm like, man, I'm just like, Paul, like how many... How many times do I think I'm doing the right thing? And it turns out to be totally opposite of what God really wants done in my life and how he wants to work in me and through me. And as we read this story, Paul was chosen by Jesus to be his apostle, his messenger. And he writes in Colossians, Colossians 1, Paul, there, let's just, I don't know how well I'm going to do by dissecting this, honestly, but I, I just want to bring out a few highlights because I've been in this book for a couple of weeks and I've been reading um, and listening to different commentaries about it. But, but one of the things that you notice right away, Paul knew who he was. Stay, stay with me here because it can get deeper, but I'm going to do my best. Paul knew who he was. Wait a minute, pastor. Didn't you, wasn't his name Saul? Wasn't he given the name Saul? But he had a name change. When he encountered Jesus, Jesus changed him, changed his name. So Paul understands the enormity of his encounter with Jesus. He stops calling himself Saul and starts identifying with what Jesus calls him, Paul. He's Paul. But not only that, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. See, this is getting good. Listen to what the Spirit is speaking to you right now. He's, he's speaking already. 
a lot of us still try to identify with what we think we are or who we think we are. But Paul knew that whenever Jesus had his encounter with him, it changed his life forever. He stopped doing what he did, and he started doing what Jesus told him to do. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, by the will of God, by God's will, not my will, God's will. And I love this this simple one scripture. I'm fired up, man. I'm fired up. (laughs) Paul learned something on this journey, walking with Jesus. That a transformed life, it doesn't only mean that you are changed for yourself. Because right there, the next word, it says, and Timothy. There's somebody right by his side. He realizes, he realizes that his life is not his own. That he's willing to give his life away and pour out as an apostle, as a teacher, as a mentor into somebody else's life. How many of you got that from chapter verse one? (laughs) That's deep. And I love it. Paul understands his role as servant. He understands what being in the body of Christ is all about. He understands that even though God has given him a measure of authority, he brings himself down to a relational level and calls Timothy, and he says, our brother. You know, there's something about serving in the body of Christ together. You know, when I see men lock arms, when I see (coughs) families join together in prayer, we're together as a family. We're knitted together. And we need each other. We need to pour into each other's lives. We need to help each other fight those battles. You know that song, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. How many of you know that sometimes you you, you, you get picked off if you're fighting alone? Don't fight alone. It wasn't me. Electrify. (laughs) All right, okay, I gotta go, I gotta go. So it says in verse two, "To to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ, at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And then he goes into this prayer, and and I I am going to read it just for context um, and just to formulate what's going on, but he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that sprang from the hope that is, stored, that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it, as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told, told us of your love in the spirit. So get this, Here, here's Paul writing a letter to the Colossians. Now Paul, it's in, in history, we're, we're not, I mean, we're, we're pretty certain that Paul never have, has never met these people. But Epaphras carried the gospel message into Colossae and he actually became a pastor of the home church there. And so what was going on was there's lives transformed. Think about little new hope. Tiny little new hope. Think about lives transformed right here. You all have gathered together as a community of faith, have made this your home church, and you guys are all in this together, living life together, growing in Jesus Christ of the faith and the love that you had once heard from whoever it was, your dad, your mom, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, (laughs) whoever it was, brought you in to this I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And and so they're living in this community. And so Paul hears, Paul hears from Epaphras about the Colossians. But but it's, if you read the full book, you'll go back and read it. I don't even know if we're going to take this time to do that here in the next few weeks, but just go back and read it. But there were some issues that rose up 
in the Colossian church. So what Paul's desire was, was that he loved Christians. He loved them. He used to kill them before, but now his responsibility is to be a brother, to be an apostle, and to set things in order for that local church. Some things kind of got off. Some theology was kind of out there. And Paul, in his love for the people of God, penned it on paper with the help of other people. Go and read the book. Okay? Oh, gosh, I just I have so much. <clears throat> I haven't even jumped in my notes, so God help me. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So remember, Paul has never met these people but there's love in his heart for the people of God everywhere. See, the message is consistent. The message of the gospel is consistent. And whenever he's bringing wisdom through the word of God, through the teachings and the prophecies of old, and he's rightfully dividing it out, and he's delivering to these people what is the way, the truth, and the life and if you can think about this with me, what Paul has to do here is, is that he, his purpose is to establish for the Colossian church some doctrine, some theology. He wants to set this in order. So as I've studied and as I've read and as I've listened to a lot of different commentaries, I, I, there's one here that's way out there. There's one here that's here and then several of them stack up and it's like, okay, I believe this is the, the meaning that we need to navigate toward and this is what, what, I, what I've come to to bring to you this morning. And as I believe that, that there was an issue, there was an issue with who Jesus was. There was an issue in Colossians, in, in, in Colossae, in really attributing Jesus, the deity of God, of who he is, defining who he is, identifying who he is. And so the whole purpose of the book of Colossians is to establish the supremacy of, of Jesus. There, there's some other things in there, but one, the thing I want to hone in on this morning is the story that Paul is unfolding and the writing here in Colossians, he is establishing the preeminence, the su supremacy, supremacy of who Jesus is. And this is what we're gathering through what he goes on and he says. So let's jump down to verse 15 really quick. Verse 15. I'm reading in the NIV, so, so bear with me in the translation, because some of you might have different translations. But it says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. The question that I have for us this morning that I'm trying to answer is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And if I'm honest with myself, and I, and I, and I try to be, because I, I think like you, right? It's like, man, what's the deal with life? What's life all about? Like, really, Jesus, really? I mean, is he who the Bible claims him to be? Is this, what am I doing here? What am I, what am I living my life for? And, and there's two questions that we ask ourselves, every human being asks themselves this, who am I? Number one, who am I? And number two is, why am I alive? Philosophy, they call those existential questions. Why do I exist? Why do I exist? Who am I? And why am I alive? Some of you may, may have heard a teaching by Louis Giglio, kind of along these lines in the Colossians. Um, I like him, and I, another guy by the name of Mark Driscoll, I like him, he's kind of a reformed theology anyway. Don't need to know all that, but if you look at the truth, if you look at the truth, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let's look at what, he's, what Paul is trying to establish here about who Jesus is. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything 
he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Well, let's pray on that one. Lord, help us. So much truth in this. Help us to rightfully divide this, and help us to apply this to our life so we can grow and know who Jesus is for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you three things this morning, just in the, that little short passage. Number one is this. I got some help from this, so these aren't original to me. So I want you to know, Pastor is not as smart as you think he is. He studies. <laughs> have to go to the books. <laughs> Number one, you, you said it earlier when you turned to your neighbor. Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. Who is he? He's everything. And how can I say that? We just read it. I had this picture of myself and how many of you know that you know when you go back and when you look at pictures of yourself you're like wow I was young <laughs> I look good <laughs> you could do that or just me <laughs> you know you you go and you you're like wow 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 that's what I used to look like but then reality hits you right and in the morning, you get up. And what do you go stand in front of? You stand in front of the mirror. That mirror does not lie. <laughs> it's the same person, right? Different you back then. Right? I'm sorry, the same you, different year. Standing in front of the mirror today, that's you. You can't hide from the truth. Just trying to make a point. Do you know that in this, in this passage, this is, this is really awesome. I think we all try to make sense of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if you can really just understand what Jesus is saying to the disciples, to the people, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the exact representation of Father God. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. He is God. So the best explanation that I could help you understand the Trinity is that it's Jesus looking at himself in the mirror. And when he sees, he's God. And then when you stand in front of the mirror and you see, that does not lie to you. I mean, unless you go to the fair and those little funny, funky mirrors. I mean, that, that okay, I could see that. But think about it with me, an exact reputa representation of who God is. So people say, I can't see God. I can't make sense of this life. God doesn't exist. God said, here's the mirror. Look at my son. This is him. This is me in him. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Okay, this is where application gets pretty serious here. This is where I hope that you walk away this morning understanding that Jesus is everything. This is where I can call out to the front row of Mark right here. Mark, I can say this. Mark, one day you were born. You came into this, this earth. How did you come into this earth? Well, my, my mama gave me birth. 
But, but how, did, how did that happen? Well, my dad loved my mom and I came into existence. Well, then how did that, ha- how did they come? You know, there's this like this cycle. It just keeps going and going until you get back to who? The first man and the first woman. And how did they get here? God created them. So, Mark, you were created by God. Listen, you're created by God. It's that simple, church. Mark, you were created by God himself. And who am I talking about when I say God? Jesus. Jesus formed you. He shaped you. Why were you born now? Why? What was the reason? For him. For him. So so I can stop and I can have a good conversation with my longtime friend from the barrio, Chico. And I can say, Chico, you were created by God for him. By him and for him. Who are you? Why, how, how did you get here? You're his son. You're his son. It's that personal. If that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, I'm holding them back. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, man, that is real to me. It's real. I was created by him and for him. You just bow your heads. This is real. We say this with me, Jesus. I was created by you and for you. One more time. I was created by you and for you. Make that real in my life. Make that real in my life. In Jesus' name. That answers the two existential existential questions that we all ask ourselves. Who am I? Why am I alive? Why am I here? Why? You were created by Jesus for Jesus. There's an interesting teaching that I'm careful with, but I understand it from a science perspective, biology, anatomy. There's a guy by the name of Louis Giglio. He talks about laminin. I was talking to my cousin David uh, about this a few weeks ago. And it reminded me, I think he came out with this teaching like in 2008 or something like that. But the very structure, I should have, I should have sent a, a message, uh, a, a, an image for you. But you can, you can actually Google it. Google, Siri, however. Laminin. Laminin. L-A-M-I-N-I-N. L-A-M-I-N-I-N. Laminin. So think about this. The very biological structure of a human cell, okay? In the structure of the cell, it's la- laminin is a glycoprotein, for all of you that care. <laughs> it's a glycoprotein, okay? And so, so when you talk about the basic structure of life, okay? Think about it this way. When you drive down the road over here, or, or you're driving down the freeway because there's some construction on 99, and if you drive a little further north on 99, you're gonna see... They trenched out the middle of the highway. And what they've laid down is rebar. Y'all know what rebar is? It's kind of like they line it up. And then what do they do? They pour cement in there. And what does that rebar do? It, It reinforces the cement, right? Once it dries, it's solid. And then that rebar holds together the cement. And hopefully it won't crack or break apart. And it'll last longer. So what laminin does in your body is it has a very interesting shape. It's shaped like a cross. Literally, it's shaped like a cross. Okay, remember, these are microscopic visual little pictures that we're trying to give you here. But if you can imagine every cell in your body, every cell, every organ, the very basic protein, glycoprotein, that holds it together is laminin. It's shaped like a cross. Interesting. So I'm not saying that that this is theologically correct. This is where the teacher in me comes out to really be careful to say that, you know, we're going to establish a doctrine on this, but it's an observation. It's an observation. 
the very basic building block of every cell in our body is shaped like a cross. What holds your skin together? What holds it from, from falling down? Okay, some of us are wrinkling here and here, I know. It happens, but, but what's keeping it on your body? Why is it not falling off? Think about it. Uh, I lost my place. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. We don't see these cells, they're there. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's even manifested in our bodies. I think that's amazing. That makes me jump. I'm excited. Jesus is everything. Jesus holds everything together. Jesus intentionally wants to tell us a story about himself that things began and end with him. Man, I always just make it personal. God's story begins with you. God's story begins with you. Let me give you two, number two. Number two is this. Everything Jesus is, okay, Everything Jesus is, he is in you. Thank you, Pastor Louie, for helping me out. Not me, Louie, but the other Louie. <laughs> Everything Jesus is, he is in you. Let's, let's, let's think about this one. Everything Jesus is, he is in you. What are you going through right now? What are you facing in your life right now? The greater one lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's later on down in this chapter. Think about this with me. Everything Jesus is, he is in you. He is the way. We've got to be careful that we don't misinterpret that we're calling you God. I'm not saying you're God. But think about this. How many times are you faced with a decision in your life and you don't know which direction to go? Very simple. All you have to do is turn to the Jesus in you and say, Lord, show me. You're the way. Show me the way. Every time you run into a crossroads and you're thinking in this head and things are rattling around, not working out the way that you thought they needed to work out, not going the way that you thought they would go. Man, I'm a little confused right now in life. I, things aren't exactly working out the way I dreamed them up like Cinderella in my head. Things aren't going the whole, you know, the, the movie plot that, you know, has a good ending. It's not ending well, Pastor. It's not ending well, God. God, will you bring some truth into my life here? Will you begin to show me? Lord, I need you. I need you to show me what's right, what I need to do, how to discern that. God, will you show me? Show me what's true. Make sense of this situation in my life. How about this? Again, you just feel dead. You feel dry. You feel like you just don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow morning. Your situation, I mean, and, and don't raise your hands, but I, some of us wake up with pain every single day. We wake up with pain in our bodies. You're like, I just can't go on anymore. I can't do this anymore. But how many of you know that he's the life? He's the life-giving source that you need. And whenever we seek him, he could breathe life and healing into your body. And if he doesn't take that thorn out of your flesh, guess what? He will give you the strength to endure. He'll give you the strength to keep going on day after day after day. Everything Jesus is, he is in you. I think it's very simply said, like, you know, we're born, if you're born in America, you're an American. You go outside of this country, you're still an American. I've traveled to different countries of the world. I'm still an American, okay? So let me help you understand. When you get a hold of truth, when you get a hold of truth, 
that you're his? Man, I hope this helps somebody. When you get a, when you get a, a clear picture who Jesus is, there's no one, no thing that could take it out of you. Man. Oh, help me, God. Help me, Lord. I, 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 what else can we say? Just if you can understand this, this light bulb thing that, that goes on, that you live in Christ now. You live, you've given your heart to him. And he's come and he's made his home in you. He's given you the ability to overcome. You tread upon snakes and scorpions and all the powers of the evil one. God has given you the ability to rise up. Man of God, woman of God, man of faith, woman of faith. God has given you the ability to succeed. We're careful with that message, but it's true. You know, we're not word of faith all the way and saying, hey, name it and claim it in Jesus' name. No, listen, all I'm asking for, God, can I have a little joy in my heart this morning? Can I just get a little joy? Come on. I just need a little happiness. You know, just breathe on it. Just a little. I just want that much. I need my situation to change. Listen, no enemy can take you out of God's purpose. He's not your father. Don't believe those lies. Let me, let me go down. I want to I wanna bring something out really quick. Verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And here it is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone with all, I read that again, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor struggling with all his energy, which is powerfully, which so powerfully works in me. So get this. We're going to end on this one. Number three, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Number one, Jesus is everything. Number two, everything Jesus is, he is in you. And number three, Jesus changes everything. When we go back up to first, uh, to Colossians, the first chapter, and in verse 13, he says this, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus changes everything. This this chapter is so theologically correct, doctrinally, when you start to look at it, but it's so simple. It's so simple when you really just start looking at the framework and you start to to digest what it's talking about. It's understandable. In these three phrases, Jesus is everything, right? He created everything. He's the author of life. He's the beginning and the end, the first, the last, whatever you want to want to say. He is our creator. He's our redeemer. Uh, he's our savior. He's our friend. Jesus is everything. But then everything Jesus is, he's in you. And then number three, Jesus changes everything. I'm like, I'll keep saying this over and over again. Like, it makes sense to me. It makes a lot of sense what Paul is straightening out for the Colossians. And it goes like this. Jesus changes everything because he's rescued you from darkness. The life that you once lived is no longer. The Saul that he used to be is now Paul, the man of God, by God's will, moving, speaking, doing, serving. 
I want, I didn't, I didn't write these three, three things on the screen for you to take home, but you can ask yourself the question, if Jesus changes everything, what is he changing in me? Or what do I need to change? There's three H's, three H's. We should write these down really quick. Head, heart, and hands. Head, heart, and hands. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Jesus changes everything up here. What you used to think about God, who you used to think he was, a lot of you have an image of God because of your father. Your father treated you horribly. And it's hard for you to think about God the Father as a loving God, unconditional. A God who's out to punish you. No, he's out to love you, extends his hands out to you, brings you in to wrap you up and to love on you no matter what. There's hope in this message. I'm telling you, there's hope in this message. And the hope is this, is that you can't outrun God. And you know where we're, where we're trying to outrun God is right here in our minds. We keep telling him who he is and all, all he's doing is saying, read the book. This is who I am. So one of the first places that God has to change us and that he has to change the everything of our thinking, getting us to think like he thinks, getting us to the point of, of helping us understand his ways. The second one is your heart. How many of you know that you can see with your heart? You understand that expression? You can see with your heart. Sometimes your heart sees things a certain way and, and it's not God's way. Sometimes we overly emotionally get involved with things and we are led by our feelings and our emotions and then it takes us out of God's will. Oh, be, be careful. So I've, I've been there. I've lived it. Being emotionally moved is sometimes not God. <laughs> we act on, you know, a feeling or an emotion and we get taken out of God's will. But God wants to give you hearts that see through his eyes. And this is, this is important because what I believe is that once you get it worked out here, things change in your mind. And how do you change your mind? You get the word of God in you. Romans 12, we read that last week. Change your mind. How? Get God's word in you. What, is your, what does the word do? Transforms you. Changes you. Moves you from where you were into some, someplace new. Same thing in your heart. God gives you eyes to see him. Desire to seek after him. Opens up your heart to pursue his mad love for you. Remember I said last week, uh, a couple weeks ago now, I don't know, was it last week already? I can't make my wife love me, but I could sure demonstrate to her. But it's up to her to open up her heart to me to receive the love that I'm demonstrating to her. That's our love relationship with God. Will you open up your heart to him and will you see him for who he is? When you do, I'm telling you, something changes in you changes your hands, changes everything you begin to do on the outside of your body, <laughs> changes how you begin to live life around you. You go from pushing people away to embracing them in love. It's the craziest thing. Can I, can I help somebody this morning? Uh, maybe I'm just talking to myself, but it, you know, sin is, is bad. <laughs> can I say it again? Sin's bad. One, one scholar I was reading, he says, the sin, is the, sin is like treason. You know, sin is an enemy of God. And when you think about how God looks at sin, he detests sin. He detests sin so much that there's a penalty that you have to pay for it. This is where it gets good. Think about it. God is so just and God is so holy. He cannot allow sin to stand in his presence. 
we are all guilty of sin because of our forefathers, Adam and Eve. Somehow our will begins to bend and to do what is totally opposite of what God wills for our life. So we have a bent toward certain iniquities, we call them, certain things that get rooted in your life, certain things that cause you to act out, to do things on the outside that are totally detestable to God. Sin. It happens here, here, and out here. So if you think about this with, with me this morning, God has come. And what did, what did Jesus, Jesus here, it says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Boy, I hope this helps somebody. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He's your redeemer. He's your reconciler. And if we, could, if we could hear what Paul is telling the Colossians, it could change our lives forever of how we think, how we feel, and how we do things. Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes our history. Jesus changes the trajectory of our lives. Jesus, when you know who he is, when you know who he is, will set your course on a whole different path, just like Paul the Apostle. But he gives you the choice. So let me, let me offer this to you as we get ready to close. When Jesus, when Jesus came, he set things in order how they should be from the cross on. I mean, we go further back from when he first came in, from when he was born. But when we think about his life, when we talk about the Jesus story, there's some things that God is doing to make things right again with that love relationship with you. But he says, you know what? I know you can't do this. I know you can't. You, you can't do it. So I have to do it for you. And so Jesus comes and he lays his life down on the cross. He's laying down willingly that sacrifice. Why? Because we're not going to ever be good enough, ever. My righteousness is like filthy rags, man. It's horrible. No matter how good I try to be, it's still never going to be good enough. So why believe in Jesus? Because he's the, he lived the perfect life. He lived the perfect life. Oh, okay, I'll say it, Lord. I'll say it. Jesus came. Jesus came, okay? He lived a life that we could not live. I'm saying it slow. Jesus came. He lived a life that we could not live. He died a death that we could not die. I'm trying to say it. He died a death that we couldn't die. He paid our debt that we could not pay. And he gave a gift that we could not give, eternal life. He lived a life that we cannot live, died a death that we cannot die. He paid a price that we cannot pay. And he gave a gift that we cannot give. God's grace God's grace, God's grace. Do you know that hell is not created for us? Do you know that, oh man, this is, this is gonna, maybe theologically this might blow your mind, but do you know that Jesus didn't come for the fallen angels and for Lucifer? Do you know that his blood will never be for them? The blood is for you. Who? That blood is for you. The devil's home is hell. All of his demons, they're going to dwell in the lake of fire forever with Jesus ruling 
over them. Okay? Think about the gospel here. This is the message of truth. Jesus came to save you, rescue you, deliver you, set you free. He paid that sin debt for you. You can never pay it, but his blood is worthy and he paid that price. This is the gospel. This is truth. He's encountered you in the condition of sin that you were in, broken, hurt, in pain, and he rescued you with his blood and washed you clean. Redeemer, redemption for the forgiveness of your sin. I'm just hammering it in so you can walk away with this message this morning. Do you know, do you know the depth of this? Do you realize the depth of the gospel truth in this? Jesus' blood, okay, washes away the sin of mankind. Again, the angels and the demons, they, they, God's dealing with them. They, he didn't come for them. Jesus came for us. This is the truth of, of what I think. Okay, this is how pastor takes the word of God and applies it to his life. I am no good. No matter how good I think I, I am no good. I'm deserving of hell without Jesus. All of us in here without Jesus without our choice to believe in the Son and what he did. What does the Bible say in Revelation? We will be cast along with the devil and his demons into a lake of fiery forever and ever and ever. So people ask the question, no, I don't believe in hell, Pastor. I don't, do this hell exi- I don't believe hell exists. Now listen, there's going to be a day, there's going to be a day that one day you're going to stand before God, okay, You're going to stand before God and you're going to willingly accept his salvation. Now we're getting into some theology. (laughs) You're going to willingly, like right now you have a choice to believe in the power of the blood of Jesus to wash away your sin, forgive you of all your sin. You have the choice, okay? That's called salvation. But the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Will you, will, you, will you help yourself this morning and believe upon the cross? Believe upon the life of Jesus that he says who he says he is and willingly say, I believe by faith that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's, that's called salvation. But there's another word in theology we throw out there. It's called subjugation. Subjugation. And this is what this means right here. One day, If you don't bow your knee willingly to confess him, one day your knee will bow. You will be subject to the authority of Christ and who he is. One day you're going to acknowledge, you're going to acknowledge, all of us are going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Am I losing some of you? Stay with me. There's going to be a day where we're going to stand before God. But will you do it willingly now by faith? You're saved by grace through faith. Through faith, I accept the sacrifice of Jesus for the redemption of my sins. And if you live, if you live, I don't have to do what the Bible says. I'm going to go out and live the way I want to live. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to have fun. "Ah." Oh, man. You're playing with fire. You're playing with fire. What the world has to offer you is death and decay and an eternity. I I, I didn't even mean to say this this morning, honest. I I just think it's for somebody that we need to hear it. And listen, if it's if it's over and over again, that's the until Jesus comes back, the gospel is going to be preached from here. You know, I think for some reason, I I just don't want to be that church, that guy that says, hey, you didn't give them a chance to hear the truth. You didn't tell them I was the way. You just tried to make them feel good. You wanted to fill the seats out there. You wanted to be the next best, baddest church in Selma. That's not me. Can't do that. What What I'm here to say is let's talk about the truth of the gospel. God's love is unconditional for each one of us, right? 
receive him. It's your choice by faith before one day you'll be made the bow. You'll be made the bow. Your knee's going to bow. You're going to be subject to his authority. It's either going to be, it's now or never. Man, I'm weighing this out. Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Will you allow him to change you, church? We allow him to change your, your thoughts, your, your feelings, your emotions, your actions. Will you stand with me this morning? I put on the screen. I think I forgot to allude to it. But will you just make this confession with me this morning? There it is. If you can say that, don't have to shout it out right now, but just say that. If you mean this, will you say it? Say, Jesus is in me changing everything. One more time. Jesus is in me changing everything. So, Father, right now, as we made that declaration, let it be a prayer. Let that declaration echo in our, in our minds and in our hearts. Let it motivate us to change what we do and how we worship you, how we live our life day in, day out. How we encounter our loved ones, our wives, our kids, our, in our workplaces, the people that we're surrounded with. God, I pray that you just begin to change us from the inside out. I just thank you for the redemption that you have provided for us on the cross, Jesus. That we can say, as Paul said, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for new beginnings. And this morning, I'm just gonna say this prayer. I just feel like we just need to all say it together. Just the rededication of our life during this time of Easter as we stand here this morning. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I open wide the door of my heart I ask you to come in, be my Lord and be my Savior. Wash me in your blood, forgive me of all my sins and wipe away my past. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin. I turn my back on the devil and demon forces. And I embrace you today, Jesus. Give me a new heart and a new start. Change my actions, change my motives, change my way of thinking. Now, Holy Spirit, Give me the power, power to overcome all the works of the evil one and allow my life to be a testimony, a living testimony to the goodness of God at work right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we we just, I want to acknowledge you here. Just will you raise your hand real quick? I want to, I just want to say hi to you real quick. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Listen, this is the life that we call the abundant life in Christ. That as we keep living our life, we just keep living it out day after day after day after day. It may not change our circumstance, but I'll tell you what, it will change the circumstance, amen? You get that? God changes everything, amen? Will you receive a blessing? Father, may you bless your people, keep them, cause your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them, Lord. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.